Hello, everybody. Welcome to MassBio's weekly town hall with President and CEO Bob Coughlin. I'm Jennifer Nason, Senior Director of Communications for MassBio, and we're thrilled to have with us today Congresswoman Catherine Clark, who has proudly served the 5th District of Massachusetts since 2013. Congresswoman Clark serves as Vice Chair of the Democratic Caucus, is a member of several other caucuses in Congress, including the Congressional Progressive Caucus and the Women's Caucus, and is committed to advancing policies to help children and families succeed. Welcome, Congresswoman. Welcome, Bob. I'm going to turn it over to you to say a few words about our guest. Hey, Thanks, thank Jenny. you. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. We've got a really large crowd joining the Mass Bio Virtual Town Hall this week, and I can only think that it's because we have such an amazing guest on our, our broadcast here today. Um, you know, Congresswoman Catherine Clark is a friend to all of us. She's a friend, a, a friend of mine. She's a friend to everybody who works in this industry, and, and more importantly, She's a friend to the patient community, and I'm going to tell you why. She's held various positions in, in public uh, of public office. She's I got I first met you when you were on the school committee in Melrose, where, <laughs> where right. you come from, and then your time as a state rep, and your time in the Massachusetts Senate, and then your meteoric rise to Congress, and and everything that you've been able to do in the United States House of Representatives, including becoming the vice chair of the Democratic Caucus. So folks, just so you understand, she would never say this, but I'm gonna say it. She is the sixth highest ranking Democrat in the United States Congress. And, and that's something that, you know, as, a, as a, someone from Massachusetts, I'm so proud of that. I'm so proud to know Congresswoman Catherine Clark. I'm proud to call her a friend and I can't thank, uh, Congresswoman, I can't thank you enough for the years, every office you've ever held, you've always been patient driven, you always support what is important for innovation as it relates to solving a medical need and helping sick people. You know, and not only is the CEO of Mass Bio do I appreciate that, but the dad of an 18 year old young man that is living with cystic fibrosis right now. I mean, none of that would have been possible. He wouldn't have been able to graduate from Dedham High School this past Saturday if it weren't for people like you in government ensuring that we have what we need in this industry to, to solve our medical needs. So I just wanna say thank you for being here and I wanna thank you for everything that you do. This, uh, we're gonna have a, a real frank discussion today. We're, we're living in really unique and somewhat scary times. And without leadership from people like you, we wouldn't get through it. So I'm grateful for you. So thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Bob. It is a pleasure to be here. And uh, it is something that I've always admired about your leadership is not only um, your your intellect and your and your data driven facts driven approach but that you also have been so open about your son's journey and what it means and that this isn't just um uh companies and bottom lines this is really about patients and it's about saving lives and mm -hmm. the quality of people's lives and that's what drives you and that's what i find as i visit um, mass bio members throughout my district that that's what drives them so it makes for a wonderful partnership and I'm deeply grateful for your friendship. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you both for that wonderful opening. Um, I'm going to dive in with a few questions but as always audience we want this to be an interactive discussion so please use the Q&A tab right at the bottom and just ask questions throughout and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so just to start I mean Bob mentioned we had a really tough time you know in our country anti-racist anti protests have swept the country, but it seems like real change is coming. Congresswoman, can you talk a little bit about how you're supporting constituents during this time, and if you see this having a real lasting impact? And then, Bob, perhaps you could jump in with how you're supporting members and mass bio employees. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jenny. I think that is the question that is on every American's mind. Um, how do we take this moment in our history uh, when we looked at the brutal murder of George Floyd and the, the reaction that we're seeing, the roiling of this country over coming to grips with the very, very long uh, chains of slavery that still impact our Black community today, police brutality, um, mass incarceration, and how all these issues are interwoven 
with education and housing and mental health. And it's, it's a moment um, where we are seeing such diverse protesters take to the streets and demand action. And uh, what I'm committed to doing is to not let this moment pass, not react in some ways that uh, we've seen in the past where we're very concerned. There's an outpouring of a concern after a particularly horrific incident, but then we kind of check the box and move on. And I really feel that our country in so many ways is being tested at this moment and that we're at an inflection point and a decision point whether we are going to strive to really put those ideals of equality and liberty and justice for all into action, or are we just going to continue to talk about them? Uh, I've been thinking a lot about uh, my role as a white woman um, and you know, being part of a system, whether I want to be or not, of uh, white supremacy and how we have to look at that. It's not easy. Um, it's not easy to address how we can be part of a system that we abhor. But that's part of, I think, the way that I have to interact with my constituents and all Americans is to come to it with humility. You know, there's a lot of jokes about this is this seems to be brand new for a lot of Americans, but it's not new. It is in the the roots of our country and the roots of our history. Um, but I am hopeful. Uh, I always am so um, honored to serve with John Lewis and. He said to us on a call last week, uh, which we were so grateful that he joined because he's been very ill and in cancer treatments, but he was able to join us. And um, he shared that while he thought the soul of America was in better shape than it is, that in his long career of fighting for civil rights and, and taking action, um, protecting that that right to vote that is so critical at this juncture as well, um, that he was hopeful because of what he was seeing and the diversity of the people who were in the streets and the diversity of voices calling for justice and sort of this awakening of white America. So his, uh, his call to us was to be bold, don't get weary, uh, and, and make sure that this is a time where all of us take a hard look at our, our role in our culture and society, uh, whether we, we did it on purpose or we were born into it because of the color of our skin, and to do better and to really uh, work to bring not only the legislative changes that we need, um, there was a great package introduced yesterday by House Democrats to address police brutality from many different angles, but no one piece of legislation is going to be the answer here, and it's going to take all of us um, really thinking about how we invest our tax dollars and, and how, we, um, how we move forward. Uh, the diversity is our strength, but our power comes from unity. And um, so, uh, you know, it's been a very, very trying time. But one uh, very young constituent in Malden, I attended a vigil there on Friday, gave great words, I thought. And she challenged the hundreds of people who were assembled to teach me my worth. And I think if we remember that, that we are teaching children mm -hmm. worth when we work for racial justice. Um, we have the opportunity to make a real difference in our communities and in the future of this country. Wow, beautifully said. And uh, what tremendous words from such a young person, right? I uh, know. It's amazing. 14 years old. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. And I think it is that generation that's actually going to make this change happen, you know, and we need to pave the way for them. And, I, and again, to follow up on those 
beautiful words, Congresswoman. You know, I, in my life, I haven't seen this level of activism against ra racism in my life. And it's amazing yeah. to see so many Americans, right, show their support, you know, and we have to ensure that this really creates lasting change, right? Enough talk, right? Let, let's That's make right. sure that we can make the change. And, you know, I, I think we were already at a tipping point and the murder of George Floyd was the breaking point. And, yeah. you know, you, we can't lose fact that you need to couple that. We were talking prior to that about the, you know, the, the disproportionate share of illness from COVID-19 that was affecting the minority populations as well, right? So there's underlying... Healthcare things there is as well. And you know, at Mass Bio, you know this, we, we, we really came out several years ago with our gender diversity strategy, and we focused on equality, diversity, and inclusion, and brought in a director of ED&I here at Mass Bio. And you know, I guess what we need to say now that more than ever, we're gonna use our privilege and position of influence as a life sciences trade association here in Massachusetts and across the country to stand up for change and we will speak out against racism and discrimination in all forms and we will you know demand accountability for all players we heal people in this industry and this is a situation that needs healing and we need to step up and and you know I'm proud of the outpouring from of support that have, has been coming from uh, our member companies in the community and how they can rally behind you know our, our brown and black co-workers to, 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 to make this happen and have, you know, real conversations. Let's have real conversations about how this impacts all of us. And I guess personally, and Jenny knows this, what, what we've been trying to do at MassBio and what I've been trying to do is really listen more than ever, right? As a white man, right? Listen yeah. and learn and have an open door. And then don't, don't just listen and learn and do nothing. Listen, learn, and then figure out what we can do as it relates to creating an on-ramp for, for minorities to break into the life sciences industry. We are a predominantly white industry. Let's change that and let's create the pathways so that we can create opportunity and we'll be better, right? Everybody knows that the more diverse any group is, the better the outcome is, and we're trying to solve unmet medical needs. What's harder than that? The more diverse yeah. we are as an industry, the better we're gonna do for patients. So we're gonna continue the fight and, and you know, thank you for your leadership because a lot of this change is gonna come from government and our elected officials, and we're, we're, it's great to have you on board. Well, I think, uh, you know, Mass Bio and this industry really are in a unique position and that you are healers and you are scientists. And we know that this pandemic uh, didn't create uh, healthcare disparities, it didn't create racism, uh, but it has held up a magnifying glass. And we cannot ignore, um, we knew these problems were there, but we ignore them at our peril. And this invisible coronavirus um, pandemic has shown us that even though we can't see it, the effects are very real and we're all mm -hmm. together. Um, you know, that we all take responsibility together to keep everybody safe. And I think that you are going to be at the front lines of how do we honor George Floyd um, and others, Breonna Taylor, through action. And because of your ability to have um, incredible industry leaders come together and talk about how we make sure that Every single person in this country has, a, you know, has the ability to access quality health care. And how do we make sure that we are having those uncomfortable situations? You are right. Much like politics, um, yeah. you know, your industry is dominated uh, by white people and white men. And mm -hmm. so it's going to be, you know, we have to have it. It's, it's uncomfortable. Um, but we have to have those conversations and take action around those hiring, who we put in leadership roles, who is developing the drugs. It's as important as having diversity in the room when we're developing policy. And I think Mass Bio's in, in such an incredible position to really be part of lasting change for our country. 
So you both bring up such wonderful points. And I think, you know, we all have to remember we have to do what we can personally to affect change, whether it's, you know, within our family and friend circle or within our industries. Um, and you also mentioned kind of the importance of, of voting, right? Of, of getting yeah. um, of getting your voice heard that way. And it, it seems like with everything going on that we can forget that we're actually in a presidential election year as well. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, Congresswoman, can you talk a little bit about your role as vice chair of the Democratic Caucus? You know, your insights on that political landscape in DC, you know, both around these anti-racist protests and also around an issue that Bob and I were talking about almost exclusively for the last three years, it seems like, around the drug pricing debate. And you know, how, how both of those have kind of shifted in the last few months. Yeah, you know, well, I hope one thing this pandemic is gonna do is ground us once again in science and, uh, and facts and good medical information. And that's certainly where this industry is always. Um, but I hope that we will begin to understand the link between the two, between good policy, um, how we are ready for public health crises. Uh, we know this pandemic won't be the last. And we've also learned something about supply chains and uh, redundancy and making investment in our public health infrastructure. Um, it was something that came up for me in a unrelated to the coronavirus way, um, working with Mass Bio, touring, uh, sitting on a panel about Alzheimer's research mm -hmm. and the necessity that as we close in on a cure, that we have to make sure that we are building the healthcare infrastructure that would be able to deliver uh, on that treatment. And how are we going to think about paying for it. And all these issues that this industry has been raising are coming to a head. And we have to think in the short term about how are we going to deliver this vaccine? If we have a, a, a vial shortage, what does that mean? Um, and so I think that our partnership has always been so important. Drug pricing continues to be something even in this pandemic that we hear about. But I hope that we can shift the paradigm a little bit uh, to be talking about the science and the, the importance of these healthcare systems uh, for people and communities and that it's so foundational as we have seen to everything else we wanna do whether that's building public housing, uh, building strong businesses, uh, supporting our main streets, infrastructure. If we don't have public health, if we don't have the ability to access healthcare systems, if we are not following the science and supporting the research that is so foundational uh, to the work that you all do, and to coming up with the cures and the treatments and the innovations that we need, we're never gonna get back to true economic health. And it's all under this umbrella of creating equality in this country. So while this is a time of anguish and great despair, I also think it's a time of hope and one that we can build on the partnership we already have and expand our mission to make sure that we are working together to be science-driven and fact-driven as we look at ways that we can increase the availability of quality healthcare and medications that people need and treatments uh, to everyone, no matter what their income is or what their insurance status is. Yeah, Congresswoman, to add to that, I mean, and you heard a little bit about this when the when Chairman Neal was kind enough to allow me to address the delegation, I believe it was last week. I don't know, the last 90 days. Was that just last it. week? <laughs> it seems like one long 90 day day, right? But when, when you think about, you know, we, you, we had a meeting with you and your team and, you, and your staff in January, I think it was, and we were talking about the value that this industry brings to the healthcare system and how can we look at value-based payments in different ways so that these new novel therapies could be absorbed into the healthcare system. And I never, ever, ever would have thought that back then, which is only a few months ago, right? Yeah. Um, I never thought that we would be sitting here today via Zoom, because it's not how we typically would interact, and say, be able to say, 
that the most important thing to the world's economy right now and the most important thing to people's health and wellness would be a vaccine. I, I work in this business and I didn't think I'd ever be able to say that. Okay, so we did miss the mark, you know, coming into this and we're learning a tremendous amount from it. But I am just so grateful that academia, industry and government here in Massachusetts for so many years now has worked closely together on a local and federal level. Because right now, when you look at the outsized role that your constituents in Massachusetts is playing in this, this battle against COVID-19, it, it, it's been truly incredible. Over 80 companies right now in Massachusetts are working on either tests, treatments, therapies, vaccines. I mean, we're seeing in the, in the whole world and in, in, in the, the country and the world as a leader here in Massachusetts. And I think it's putting a spotlight on our industry that we're gonna, and I think we're gonna, we're gonna shine in it as well because I have never seen our industry whether their competitors normally work more collaboratively, collaboratively to, to fix that. And when you think about the fact that we have 80 companies that are fighting the battle, I don't, I don't know, as of today, I think there might be nine companies that have a vaccine in the world in clinical trials. Two of them are right here in Massachusetts, yeah. right? That is yeah. amazing. So science is going to get us out of the COVID-19 problem and science only. And, and it's just amazing because as you, you know, and we've talked for a few years now, I've been extremely frustrated because people didn't really see the value of healthcare the way I looked at it because I didn't want my kid to die. Well, now everybody knows and loves somebody that they don't want to get or die from COVID-19. And we realize that in order for us to get back to so-called normal, we, we need a, a really good therapy and we need a vaccine. And it's almost like all the elected officials and policy leaders that I talk to now, it's almost like they appreciate us more. And I guess I would just say to you, thank you for always appreciating us. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I know, I mean, that, that means the world to us, but also, you know, we need to continue to work closely with you to make sure we don't screw that up. Okay. <laughs> well, well, I I know that I have uh, my uh, Massachusetts bias is on full display, but I do think we are going to be, uh, you know, the answers are going to come from Massachusetts and from this industry and from people who are on this call, and um, and that's not by accident. It's because of the work you've been doing. It's because of the advocacy on top of the incredible science. And we have to strengthen that. And we'll welcome all newcomers uh, to, uh, to understanding about the, not only the incredible scientific impact and healthcare system impacts, but the, the connection to developing a very strong economy and that the strength of your industry is so important to the strength of our overall economy, not just great jobs here, but keeping people safe, um, keeping people healthy, having those life-saving treatments. And all of it has just come to light in this pandemic. Um, and we look forward to continuing to work with this industry the incredible um, employees that you have um, to make sure that we are mutually supporting each other, that we continue to fund the NIH and BARDA and these, the FDA and agencies uh, and the work in academic that goes on that is so closely tied to your work. And you raised a great point. We've just seen collaboration among uh, competitors uh, uh, come to a new level. And yeah. that doesn't always happen even in a crisis of this magnitude. And I think it is because um, the members of MassBio really are here for altruistic reasons. They're here because they're patient driven mm -hmm. and want to end human suffering. And so it is so rewarding to see uh, that not only are we leaders in research and developing uh, life-saving solutions and treatments, but that we've risen, I've watched you all rise to this occasion 
and, and meet it with the collaboration that it needs and is required for this you know, rapidly growing global problem. So um, all, my, uh, all my faith in you has been, uh, and this industry has really been underscored during this time. Thank you both. I can't believe it. We only have a few minutes left. Wow. Um, but we you have did say it would go quickly. I know. <laughs> it goes by way too fast. Way too fast. We do have a few questions from the audience, so I want to get to at least one of them. Um, Jennifer Kearney is asking, are you aware of any examples of white leadership providing actions that are connecting to employees? Communications aside, the question of behavior to encourage trust is something we are wrestling with. So kind of that, you know, leading by example. Bob, do you have thoughts on that first? Well, well, yeah, and it, a lot of it comes down to our actions and how we behave. And one of the reasons we created Project OnRamp at MassBio, working with Life Science Cares, the Mass Life Science Center, MassBioEd, and ourselves all got together to try to create an OnRamp so that first generation college students from underserved communities could get the summer internships instead of giving them all out to the bosses, families, and friends, right? I mean, it's uncomfortable to talk about that, but where did internships go all the time? They went to people we knew. How are you ever gonna crack that cycle and break that cycle if you don't change, like how do you change things if you don't change how you do things? So these are things where we're encouraging C-level folks. One, what do you have for women and minorities in your C-level teams? What do you have on your board? Right? Look what we've been focusing as it relates to uh, diversity on boards. And, and how do we work with the venture capital firms to let them know that you can't just put all your friends on boards because you're never going to break that cycle. So I could go through a whole list of examples, whether it's board diversity, sea level diversity, project on ramp, and so many things that not only have we been working on, now we're going to double down on it. It's time, right? Buy in from everybody. Now's the time. So I could go off on that, but I'm not going to. So. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. Congresswoman, you mentioned too, you know, leading by example as a legislator. Yeah, you know, and we've, we've built a tremendously diverse staff in my congressional office. We, it is not perfect. We have a ways to go to make it truly representative of the people that we serve. But uh, we're very white at the top. My district director, my chief of staff, myself, we're all white women. And so we have been working hard in this time uh, to encourage one of our, uh, to encourage the more, the members of our staff with less seniority, even though some of them hold higher positions, that they can steer this conversation, that we have uh, not only an open door policy, but that we're going out inviting them in. Mm. Tell them what we think, but to hear from them how we can do better. Um, and where they see the spots where it may not com be comfortable to be a person of color working in our office. And I think that our initial, um, you know, response is sort of, you know, we all get a little defensive um, and we have to drop that and, and just listen and be open hearted about it and truly invite those conversations. Um, we had one all my staff, uh, it was uh, two hours on Friday, and it was driven by one of our most junior members on my comms team. Um, but the best part about it was that she felt that she could ask and that we would do it. And so it's not, it's not comfortable. We have to dust off all our policy HR handbooks and our good intentions are simply not enough. Uh, we have to do it by action, and we have to do it by reaching out and inviting those conversations, not putting the onus on our employees of color, our, you know, uh, friends of color to, to begin this conversation. Absolutely, and thank you so much for your time, Congresswoman Clark. We so appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to provide you the opportunity to say any final words to our members. Well, again, I, I just want to thank you for your partnership, for the incredible work you're doing in finding solutions in this time. Um, I hope you do consider my office uh, 
a, a partner in the work that you do and in the work that we have before us in this country on really deciding what kind of democracy we're going to have. I'm incredibly proud of the, the work and the innovation ecosystem that we have here in Massachusetts. It really is leader in the globe and it is going to be how we find our way to a more perfect union. So thank you for everything. Thank you for having me today and I hope you all are safe and well. Thank you so much. And Bob, thank you as always for bringing your energy and insights. And we hope everyone will join us next week. We're gonna hear from a very influential female CEO of our member company and talk about you know, how we're all pulling together to kind of mobilize a real response to COVID and all of the other issues out there. So thank you again and have a good rest of your week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Congresswoman. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.